thanks for joining us. Can you give a brief introduction of yourself? Yeah, so, uh, so I'm Joe Bita. I'm a principal engineer at VMware now. Uh, but we just joined VMware through uh, the startup, an acquisition of our startup, Heptio. Uh, we were in business. We joined about three months ago, um, so really been integrating for about two months. And then uh, Heptio was in business for about two years, uh, Craig McLucky and I, uh, with the, the mission of bringing Kubernetes to enterprises. Awesome. Yeah, you're one of the creators of Kubernetes. Can you give us some background on how Kubernetes came to be? Yeah, I, it's... Um, you know, the real story is that, you know, there were a set of us that just wanted to be able to hack on some stuff and not have to go through all the process of shipping stuff at Google. <laughs> uh, but there was a lot of uh, other thinking behind it also. Um, at the time, there was, uh, we at least released GCE, but then internally Google had a bunch of systems based on Borg. And there was a real question of how do we start bringing these things together? And so it was really either we take a, a all of Googlers and try and get them to start working with raw VMs, which would have felt like a huge step backwards, or we have to take the Borg model forward. And so then it was just a matter of how exactly do we get these ideas out into the world. And open source, um, you know, you play a different game when you're the underdog, and really it was more important for us to, to sort of reset the playing field between clouds. Uh, and so Kubernetes became a, a, a way for us to, to start doing that. Awesome. Did you ever expect that Kubernetes would transform the industry like it did and like become the default for cloud native? I, you know, I don't think any of us expected that it would be what it is today. I, you know, when you start something like that, you have a sense that, hey, this could be something that other people find interesting. But, you know, we don't have, you know, as, as you know, it's, it's hard as humans to understand the scale of these things once they take off. It, it goes from being something that you can feel to just, you know, numbers in terms of number of deployments, who's actually using it. Um, it's still impressive to me when I'll be at like at KubeCon or something and it'll be, you know, some company in Brazil that I've never heard of will come up and say, hey, we've like replatformed everything on Kubernetes and it's working great for us. I'm always waiting for somebody to say, hey, we started using Kubernetes and it's horrible. <laughs> I'm sure there's stories out there, but we haven't heard, uh, nobody's actually said that to me. So, so far it's been really great to hear all the stories of uh, everybody using it from all over the place. Yeah, it's amazing and it's still accelerating. I heard that like the attendees of the next KubeCon, it was, is going to be double the number than they anticipated. There's such so, still so much interest and new people flowing into it, uh, even, even now that Kubernetes is maturing, everything it's, it's building a foundation for everything else to be built on top of that. And that's, I mean, that's one of the things that we really wanted to do on multiple levels was really build something that could be built upon, both in a technical sense, but also, you know, we, we very much had the idea from the start that we wanted to build a community. We wanted to enable other people to, to own it, to, to, to be part of it, to really feel like they were um, instrumental in making it happen. And that's what happened. I mean, so it's easy for us to say, hey, you know, look at how successful it is. But the reality is, is that, you know, there are so many people that put so much time, so much effort, so much, you know, blood and sweat into it to really get it to where it is. And so it's, uh, it's really a product of the community than, than of any, uh, you know, single group of people. Yeah, for GitLab, Kubernetes came just in time. Like we were looking forward to doing operations with uh, GitLab and if it wasn't for Kubernetes, we'd have to support very many standards. But it, it's at that time, we heard, everyone was super excited about Kubernetes. And all those APIs were there uh, to do incremental rollouts and all those things that are very difficult to orchestrate otherwise. What do you think? Are those APIs meant to be used by humans? Or are they meant to offer a platform for people to build additional tooling on? I Very much the, the second one. I mean, we really wanted Kubernetes to be something that uh, uh, really sat in the middle because we knew, I mean, there was this feeling that there was this middle layer that could be relatively widely used and, and, and um, applicable, but we also had this feeling that there were going to be sort of flavors of experiences that could be built on top of it. And so something like GitLab that's very much focused on, on, on more traditional types of applications is one thing. But then you look at something like, say, Kubeflow for doing machine learning also can build on top of this base. And I think with the fullness of time, we're going to see, you know, big data also start to really find a home on top of Kubernetes as, uh, um, as we continue to improve the, the capabilities. And so um, 
Yeah, so very much. And like in terms of being used by humans, I'm horrified that people are still editing YAML by hand. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, we, the idea there was let's do something very verbose, machine readable, so that at least there is sort of like that 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 base layer with the idea that tooling and and you know and that, that the community would find something that they could agree upon that would sit on top of that. I think one of the things we didn't foresee is the fact that you know there's it's very difficult to find something that everybody can agree upon for actually that higher level abstraction, which I think speaks to the fact that the set of problems that people are trying to solve, how they're approaching these things is really fractal. Uh, and there is no one size fits all solution for a lot of the things that, that, that work on top of Kubernetes. Yeah. What do you think the holes are in cloud native today? Where still, where should we still do work? You, you name one thing. Is that something that's top of mind? Are there other things? Well, yeah, I do think that, um, you know, with respect to, you know, 80 or 90 percent of what developers need to do around sort of, you know, deploying applications, I think we can find sort of a common ground there. Um, and I think it starts looking like a, you know, a decomposed or an exploded platform as a service type of thing. And so I look at projects like uh, Knative and I think that they're starting to make uh, a down payment uh, on building that tool set for you know building those higher level experiences on top of Kubernetes. And I think one of the key learnings from looking at more traditional platforms as a service is that those things are great until they're not. And so with a well-factored layered platform, which I think as a community we're starting to build, um, once you hit one of those walls, you, uh, you can degrade gracefully. You can actually use lower levels without having to sort of throw it all away and start from, start from scratch. Yeah, I think that's something that we aspire to, um, and we call it a graduate gracefully. Yeah. When you graduate, when your app becomes super popular and you have to customize more things, you don't have to leave it. You can just start customizing more and more things that you took the default of uh, beforehand. And uh, thanks for Key Native. Um, it's well, I'm not involved in K Native heavily. I, I, I am a fan of the of, of where those folks are going, though. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things uh, that that came from the Kubernetes authors was making sure K Native worked um, not just with its own build process, but you could also point it to a Docker container and the, the K Native server and the K Native build process are separated, and that's really a boon because GitLab has its own build system. With Knative, we're using for deploying serverless, and we're going to use it for deploying pass applications. So, making that split uh, a bit more uh, composable or a bit more flexible, uh, that was a great thing that I think the Kubernetes offers uh, help with. Yeah, I think we, you know, we really wanted to to bring this sort of the Unix philosophy to this world, where there were, you know, smaller components that you could wrap your head around, and these things compose into a larger experience. And so, um, you know, there's pluses and minuses to that. I mean, there's a reason why Windows is so successful. It's this well-integrated, well-tested, you know, happy path type of thing. But I think that as we look at all of the sort of environments that something like Linux has found its way into, everything from a phone to a mainframe, that sort of, you know, componentized view has served it well as, as we've seen it, uh, you know, spread to all these different environments. And I, and I hope that Kubernetes can be as adaptable as, as that over time. Yeah, it certainly feels like the, the OS for the data center. Um, we're here at the Open Source Leadership Summit. What are, what are your thoughts on the state of open source today? Uh, I think it's a, it's a turbulent time. I think open source is evolving, um, and it has been. It's never been something that's, that's, that's sat still. One of the lessons from Kubernetes, more than anything else, is that open source today is about community and uh, as much, as, if not more, than code. Um, I think if you look at, like, say, something that's, you know, you know, like the typical open source library or, or Linux itself, the kernel, um, that's generally not something that's usable in and of itself. Um, and so you end up with companies building distributions, which means that they take this raw technology and they figure out how to make it usable. What we find though is that with most open source projects today, there is an expectation that the project will be usable out the gate, uh, whether that be 
uh, you know, a, a database or Node or NPM or Kubernetes. Um, and so the line between, you know, project and product is really starting to blur uh, as uh, open source projects start to, you know, compete with each other and compete in the marketplace and, and become much more user centric versus just code centric. And the community ends up being a really, really big part of that. Uh, figuring out how to fund that, figuring out how to motivate it, figuring out the business models around it. Uh, I think there's still a lot of uh, a lot of experimentation, a lot of uh, 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 interesting work and thinking and experimentation to be done yet. What open source projects are you excited about today? Things you see coming up? I mean, I think I'm still blown away with just the the diversity of the projects that are building on top of Kubernetes. I mean, our idea was that hey, once you have this basis, you can do all sorts of interesting things with it. Um, it's difficult for me to identify any sort of single projects. I think, you know, I look at, um, you know, some of the stuff that's going on around uh, uh, how we think about build pipelines and decomposing a lot of the CI CD space into, you know, something going from sort of the, you know, traditional type of like, hey, it's one single big system to, you know, can we break this apart and find fault lines and, and you know, subcomponents. Um, I, I think it's interesting to see that evolve, and so I think that's a, that's an interesting space. Um, every Friday, you know, me or or Chris Nova do a, uh, a TGI Kubernetes. It's a YouTube live stream where we play with new projects and, and you know, and find things that people are doing and get hands on with it. And so I, I really do enjoy just you know, you know, opening up the box and playing with a new technology and understanding how it works. And there's always something new, which is super exciting. Cool. What do you think that of the development of non-compete licenses, open source projects that uh, say, look, you can use this for free, but please don't compete with the SaaS service we're offering? You know, I think that that is, it's a tricky thing. Um, one of the things that I think makes open source communities healthy is to be very explicit about your motivations, uh, uh, what your business is, and um, and I think one of the tricky things as we look at these types of licenses is that to some degree, if you do this with a mature project, um, you're essentially rewriting the, the, the contract with your community, right? Um, people invest more than just code when they get involved in open source projects. And, you know, and if you change the rules midstream, it, it can very much feel like a, uh, uh, like a betrayal. And so I, I think I understand why people are doing this, but I think there's actually a difference when you do it you know, with a mature project versus when you do it from the get-go, you know, where if, if, if that license is already there when the project starts, then everybody knows where you stand. Um, but I think this transition of doing it after you have a mature project, I understand why, you know, why people do it, but I think it's, it's, it's very much, you know, uh, uh, tricky waters to navigate. Yeah, I think what you're referring to is that for to contribute to some open source projects, you need to sign a contributor license agreement, and that transfers the copyright to the company, and the company, the company can later on change the license of the code. And uh, it's something that, for example, the Debian project already was seeing. So when Debian started to use GitLab, they said, hey, we, we're not going to accept, or we're not going to, they were much more kind about it. They said, <laughs> we're uncomfortable with that, so we can't accept it, but would you consider changing it? And we change it for GitLab in a, in a statement that, hey, you, you keep your copyright, but you say, hey, allow it to be licensed under the current license. So it's not possible for GitLab, or it would be very inconvenient for GitLab to now change the license on the open source project. We'd have to go to all those offers and either get their permission or, or, or replace their code. And uh, I think that might, that might be something that becomes more prevalent in the industry so that the rules can be changed down the road. Yeah, I think, um, you know, that was one of the reasons why when we did, uh, uh, picked how we were gonna deal with contributions to Heptio open source projects, we picked a DCO. Um, uh, you, know, you know, with some, like, I'm not a lawyer, so we can all play armchair lawyer on this stuff, but, you know, I think with, with Apache 2, I mean, what's out there is out there, um, which is the license that the bulk of our stuff is under. Um, but, you know, it, it's really about sort of what about forward looking new contributions to the code base. And so um, it's something to consider, I think. But again, I, again, it's like there's the code and the license for the code, and then there's the community that builds around it. And there's a, even if it's not a legal contract, I think there's a social contract between 
the, the leaders of an open source project and the people who are members of that community. And uh, I think you have, to, you have to be very respectful of that social contract. I agree, and uh, at GitLab we have our stewardship promises, and we only added one so far, and we, we, we intend to stick by those nine, nine promises to the community. What do you think of the initiative of Amazon to fork and commoditize Elasticsearch? Um, man, I, you know, there are two very legitimate sides to this. On the one hand, it's open source, and, you know, part of open source is you are giving something away. I mean, and it's a very real sort of letting go. Uh, the second thing is that Amazon is adding real features that benefit real users. Um, at the end of the day, you know, people want security for the, for, you know, Elasticsearch, right? And that was something that wasn't available in the open source version of Elasticsearch. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, uh, we do need to find sustainable business models so that people continue to invest in these things. Um, and, you know, for, you know, I mean, my advice to anybody who is, who is, you know, building a company around open source is to, to understand sort of, you know, where are your levers, where is the value that you're adding, and, you know, um, you know, try and be creative about finding ways to add value where something like this can't happen. Um, uh, I feel, you know, I understand sort of the motivations on both sides of this. It's very hard to, it's very hard to, to, to say that, you know, hey, there's, there's a right or the ro uh, wrong on either side here. I totally agree. Um, Kubernetes has become very popular and there's, it seems that there's some almost defaults developing on top of Kubernetes uh, using Envoy for the data plane, using Prometheus for the metrics. Do you see that too? Do you think those will become defaults or do you think it will always be a heterogeneous thing on top? I think it'll be heterogeneous, right? You can use Linux without sort of, you know, glibc, yeah. right? Um, but, you know, two great tastes that taste great together. I think, um, you know, we look at the Linux community, there is a symbiosis happening between sort of system D and the kernel. And I think that that's something that gives a lot of people pause, right? And so, um, you know, as we see Kubernetes develop, we may find that there are components that are just so part and parcel that they might as well be, be you know, included as part of the kernel. Um, I'm not sure that we're actually there yet. Um, there's a lot of folks that use Kubernetes without Prometheus. There's a lot of, you know, folks that, that do ingress without Envoy. In fact, I would, has, you know, probably guess that, that the Nginx ingress is probably the most popular ingress out there. Um, so I, I don't think we're there yet, um, but I think this is, this is part of the excitement is that there is a really vibrant set of projects that are experimenting, trying things out, and it's gonna be you know, the, the users who decide what's successful here. What do you think GitLab should do better? <laughs> I, you know, I, I uh, oh man, I think... Um, Is that long of a list? <laughs> no, I'm not sure, I mean like, you know, part of the, you know, you know, as be, as 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 I start my career as uh, you know and 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 develop, I think one of the the sort of you know technologist diseases is thinking that you have to have an opinion on everything, <laughs> and and personally freeing myself from having to have an opinion on everything is actually so I really don't have an opinion. I mean, I I think you know you have a you know an intimate relationship with your customers. You're listening to them. I mean, that much is very very clear, and so. It's, uh, you know, I, I don't think I have enough data to really, to really sort of speak to, speak to it. I'm uh, not sure one of GitLab's values is to have an opinion on everything, but we do like strong opinions weekly held. Uh, right. So we'd like to change our opinion in, in the face of new data. Is there something else you'd like to talk about? Oh, um, well, you know, I think it's worthwhile to talk about our motivations for Heptio joining VMware. Um, you know, Heptio's point of view is that we really see ourselves as a uh, cloud independent ally for enterprises as they look to adopt Kubernetes. Uh, and I think that as we start to see, you know, these, um, uh, you know, enterprises start to adopt cloud, understanding the power dynamics and the relationship with cloud, 
Uh, I think that there's a lot of concern about, you know, how do I get some independent advice, independent thought, independent support uh, that's going to actually stay with me as I, you know, figure out where, where my position lands as I move from on-prem to cloud and beyond. And, uh, and that, was, that was a big part of, of Heptio's value proposition to, uh, uh, to companies. And so, you know, when we look around the industry, I think VMware is in a unique position to continue that. Um, it, you know, I'm continually impressed with VMware's connection to their customers, uh, understanding the, the needs of, of enterprise IT, and then also being really thoughtful, uh, you know, about how do we partner with those folks as they, as they go through their cloud journey. And I'm, I'm really excited about Heptio being, being a part of that and then understanding how VMware can, can you know, use Kubernetes as, uh, as they continue to, to help customers on that journey. So Haptio, I think, was one of the first ones that had like a free Kubernetes distribution that came with all the upgrades and everything uh, bundled. Is that is that the case now? Is that the case going forward? Then? Actually, you know, our our take on it, and this goes back to what we talked about earlier around um, open source projects and products are actually starting to blur lines. Um, you know, we have invested and we continue to invest in parts of the Kubernetes project which traditionally would be part of a distribution. So, uh, uh, you know, Tim St. Clair, who, who works for us, is the, is the SIG chair and, and does a lot of work around SIG cluster lifecycle, which is essentially the upstream install and cluster lifecycle and management. A lot of the tools that you'll often find in a distribution, yep. we're working to implement those things upstream. And so one of the things that we wanted to do with, with Heptio was, was not to have our own distribution, but instead make Kubernetes be the distribution. And so um, it was an interesting path for us to take because to some degree, like it's like, well, what is the unique IP that Heptio is bringing? With respect to the core Kubernetes stuff, the, the answer is like, we don't want, we want to democratize this because if Kubernetes is everywhere, if it's available, then there's this higher level platform that everybody can benefit from. And I think we, we at GitLab encountered the same thing when we sold uh, consultancy to install and upgrade GitLab. We took those lessons, put them in the documentation, put the in, in the installer, and people didn't need our consultancy anymore. So you kind of, if that, if, if you hope for that to be your business, as you start contributing back, you kind of strangle that business. Yeah. And I think one of the interesting things is that the most valuable software company, enterprise software company ever sold was Red Hat, which <laughs> was pretty, uh, fun, pretty fanatic about never having any IP. If they bought a company with unique IP, they would open source that. So there is a business to be built on that, and it was super great to see that VMware recognized like the value of Haptio and 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 uh, um, acquired you guys at a at a, at a considerable price. <laughs> no comment <laughs> on that one. <laughs> But yeah, no, it's been a, it's been a great journey joining VMware. Uh, really have enjoyed uh, meeting everybody around the company, and um, and I think that there is a you know there's a real sort of desire within VMware to to evolve the business, move forward, and and adapt to the to the new world that we're all living in. Yeah, and I think VMware embracing AWS and Azure and and building the VMware services on top of the clouds is 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 living proof of that. Exactly. Thank you so much for this interview. All right, well, thank you.